テルルティカオコンマイナイキャイマフィチフィチキャイマーロナロナトゥププルヤテルルヤオヘポヘポヤオマテアキョロナカウタミヒンドイキアカウタカトークフルイマイナイキトマトキトキエナイタオナキョロナカウタウキナタナカフェルワオアイトライリアキトークナイイウイナマウリテナカウトキョロナカウタカトークはい。And after this, maybe you'll change that idea. And while we're on the subject of boats, I'd like to talk about the theme in general、uh, behind me and the work here that we have. Not that I'll mention America's Cup more than once, but <laughs> America's Cup. But the theme of the waka, of the canoe and the sea, it's lovely that the gallery has the space here because the theme of the canoe. And the oceans is particularly important, perhaps simplistic, but it's particularly important to understanding a Polynesian way of thinking and a Māori way of thinking, Māori or Polynesians. And there's fundamental differences between the way Europeans have perceived the sea in the past and the way Māori have perceived the oceans. I don't know if you're aware of a Pele Hauofa, a Tongan author, but in his worldview, the Pacific is not just an ocean that's That's landless, with very few potentials or minerals and so on. But it's a sea of islands, this thing with possibilities, with potential. And then, so we see the Pacific as not a place to pollute, but a place that's a food source. So there's very there's fundamental differences. Like in the Western world, few perhaps the sea was always associated with death. Um, from T.S. Eliot's Death by Water right through to the idea of baptism, the idea that, of pushing someone down into the ocean in order to be reborn again. Or even that notion of the ocean or Hades, hell, as being depicted as a fish with his mouth open, and Christ as the fisher of souls. The idea of the, of the ocean as being a symbol for death has been strong in Europe. So it's no surprise that while Europeans were hugging the coastlines of Europe, Poly Polynesians had traveled a distance as far as, or as greater than the Americas, from Aotearoa, New Zealand in the south, right up to Hawaii in the north, and then to the east, to Rapa Nui, to Easter Island. So the sea has always been a source of food, a source to be honored. And it's out of that context That Māori see creativity. Creativity, the gift of carving and the gift of weaving, all these gifts came from Tangaroa. In tradition, Ruote Pupuki, a famous mythological figure, traveled under the sea to rescue his drowning son. He came across a house where Tangaroa dwelled, the god of the sea. And in that house, he saw carvings that he thought were people attached to the walls. Those carvings, the talking popo, the talking carvings, he later discovered weren't people, but were mere images, and he brought that gift back to the surface, to Aotearoa. And that's how carving and the gift of carving and all the arts was born under Tangaroa. It's not surprising also that when missionaries came to the Pacific, Tangaroa was then transformed into a demon who was demonized. In Hawaii, for example, Their word for Tangaroa, the god of the sea, Kanaloa, became a symbol of the devil. So we're looking at opposing viewpoints of the ocean as a food source, as something to be revered, and then traditionally in Europe, perhaps something to be feared. So, anyway, out of that, we have this installation. The idea, the central idea of the waka, of the, of the canoe, being so important. Throughout Polynesia, throughout Māori. 
When we identify ourselves, we identify ourselves by our canoes, by our waka. The idea of water too is essentially important, so different from this culture here, which is land-based. And the idea that one of the expressions is Biki mai kake mai, ho mai te wai water ki ao. Bring forth the waters of life. So again, it's appropriate that that idea, that theme of water, be seen in this installation. Words like uh, Chris Booth's mountain are also another way of identi identifying where people are from, not only by their waka, their canoe, but also their, their particular mountain. In this case, I believe they're from Tifare Tor and the mountains in the central North Island. In some ways, it's ironic that my works are here because in this context, they, they look like waka, they look like canoes, but they were never intended for that. The far work there is um, the Kohau Tengira. And it comes from a famous saying. I like to take sayings or expressions from the culture and actually use those as starting points because the language itself bears evidence to many words, to many phrases that don't exist in English or coincide in English. So, the Kohau Te Waka is a symbol of that. It means the eye of the needle. And it's again about that process of creation. In tradition, there's ten stages of the poor, of the night, before creativity was born, Tal Marama. And that was re represented by that gold there, the gold that you see on the top there. Light coming forth into the world, giving us the gift of creativity. And then the firework there, the red one, was actually an ode to Rangi Maria Hetet, who was a very famous weaver. Uh, who died last year, and the name Kamakura refers both to a red cloak and a rainbow. So you have those meanings incorporated there, those double entendos. At home recently there's been a lot of debate as, as to appropriation, and it's interesting that one of the painters, Gordon Walters, I always forgot his name, Gordon Walters, had, had used that word Kamakura as a theme for his work, but without any understanding of kaukura as being either a cloak or a rainbow, or any of the meanings, and just using it as a design element. So, what many of young Māori artists are doing are addressing those, those issues of trying to replace back the culture. To use a Eurocentric term, refer to the Renaissance, the Māori Renaissance, a re regrowing of all these images. Like Lisa's work here, reference to Matariki, in order to tie up the entire installation. Another interesting twist on the works is the far work there by Peter Robinson. And that he's pointing out some of the ironies of being classed as Māori and that situation of being identified as Māori. Well, the numbers there, if you read them, going from one, red representing a bloodline, right through to 1.5 and so on, right down to 164th, they're actually blood pronouns. So again, he's referring to that identity issue and this work where you read from a full Māori right through to a 164th or 132nd Māori, as Peter Robinson is. So he's bringing attention to the fact that where is that division between who is Māori and who is not, with that question of what percentage of Māori blood are you? So these are just some of the issues that we address um, in our work, whether they be statements trying to re reaffirm the culture or statements that are talking about those issues of identity within. They're all things that relate back to perhaps that Waka concept or the idea of the sea. So with that, I'll finish. I'll finish with a chant. Whakataka te hau ki te muri, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Ki mā kina kina ki uta, ki mā tara tara i tai. Ki hia ki ana te ata kura, he pau, he teo, he au atu. Cease our winds to the north, cease our winds to the south. May the murmuring breeze of the land subside, may the wind from the sea subsist. A touch of frost, a touch of dawn, the promise of a glorious day. So, thank you everyone.